Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Wordy Yurung uh, High Ground. Uh, my name is Jennifer Kloster, and on behalf of Geelong Regional Library Corporation, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you all here today to our fabulous event with the wonderful June Factor. And she's going to be discussing her latest book, Soldiers and Aliens, an absolutely fascinating book. I loved reading it. It was just great. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Wadurung uh, people and the Eastern Ma original owners of the lands on which the library service operates. We pay respect to the Wadurung and Eastern Ma elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge and celebrate all First Nations peoples of this land as the custodians of learning, literacy, knowledge and story. I'm really delighted to have been invited to facilitate today's event with June. Um, June is a, a graduate of the University of Melbourne um, and we're actually from the same history department, now called the um, School of Historical and Philosophical Studies, sometimes known as SHAPS. <laughs> um, uh, she's also a graduate of the University of London and she's currently an honorary senior fellow and an honor, uh, at the University of Melbourne and an honorary associate of the Museum of Victoria. She's a very well-known and highly respected folklorist, I love that word June, social historian and writer with a special interest in children's folklore and language and I actually was so delighted to be able to go into my daughter's bedroom and grab these wonderful books that my children adored, all, most all of them done by June, um, with the wonderful All Right Vegemite, Unreal Banana Peel, Far Out Brussels Sprout, Roll Over Pavlova. So June knows a great deal about a great many things. <clears throat> so this remarkable book, Soldiers and Aliens, tells of the extraordinary contribution of non-British subjects to Australia in World War II. Um, and their contribution to Australia's war effort is a really genuinely engrossing story. And I was just delighted to find so much um, beautifully distilled Australian history, social history, cultural history, the history of these men who had come out often as refugees, as migrants, um, many of them just before the Second World War broke out, uh, escaping from dictatorships and really brutal regimes of Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, um, and other countries in the European theatre of war. And so it, I, I had no idea about these men and their contribution to Australia's war effort, but it really is an engrossing story and a great achievement, June, I have to say. That's for kind of It's you. really beautifully written and just a really easy, clever read. And I just had so, so many things. I was sort of like, oh, wow, I didn't know that, I didn't know that. And, really fascinating. So it provides a lot of new insights into this really critical his period of Australian history. So please wel join me in welcoming June Factor to our beautiful library. <coughs> thank you. <coughs> Delighted well, to have you. Thank you very much. <coughs> um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about why I wrote the book and mm. some of the thing about it, but probably the most useful thing I will or to do is to answer any questions you have or to hear some of your comments. I'll be very interested in that as well. The book's uh, now available, but I'd, um, it got launched just this last week. I think it was last week. It's all a bit of a blur, actually. <laughs> um, but I, I am the, the child of one of the men that I write about. Uh, I, well, I was a child, of course, uh, uh, of one of the men that I write about in the book. And so my memories, I was very young, but my mem I still have some memories of my father in uniform. And I think I have some memories, this won't surprise you, um, a little, a very young little girl, of being interested in the sort of sack that he brought home because that, I think, I, first time I ever saw or ate a violet crumble. <laughs> I think, because I think in the army you could get things that you couldn't get um, in, you know, ordinary civil life. I have a, I have a very uh, pleasing memory of a violet crumble. But uh, what I wrote this book a long time after I, uh, that period and indeed after the, my parents have been dead for some years 
there were questions I wish I could have asked or which I, that I didn't think to ask while they were alive. But I was always very interested in their stories. Though there was not much conversation about the time that my father was in the army. That didn't come up much at all in all the years later. It was my father, my parents were Jews who came from Poland. Uh, in, my father migrated in 1938 and my mother with her infant me in her arms in 1939. My father was interested in the world, took politics seriously, I think, all his life and had made an early decision that Europe was not a safe place with German rearmament which was taking place at the time at a rapid rate. Mm. And fascism mm. that underlay the rearmament. I don't know, a question I never asked, all the questions you wish you could ask the dead. I never asked, um, what conversations did you have about coming to Australia? They had, my mother, I remember telling me a story once that she knew nothing about Australia, nothing at all. And she asked a, a friend of hers who had an atlas to please look up Australia. And the friend looked up Australia and told her, came back with some knowledge. Australia was a country um, that was very hot and it was peopled by people with black skins. And that's the information my mother had on her arrival. And I, I think... The day that she arrived with infant me was uh, one of those terrible bushfire days when the, the uh, smoke and ash fell on Melbourne. I think it's in the history books. Mm. And some of you might have heard it, heard it yourself, about it yourselves. So there's my mother with an infant in her arms has no English, thinks she's coming to a very hot country where everybody is black, <laughs> and it is black because the ash is falling in Melbourne. <laughs> yes. I remember that story. Um, so I grew up with stories. That, that my father was the main story for me in the family. Uh, and perhaps, and I've always been fascinated by the, exp the way... The accidents of history shape people. The accident of where they're, where they're born, the accident of the kind of family into which they're formed, and the circumstances. And I think often we think we make our lives. Well, we do partly, I think, make our lives, but also a lot of, of what happens to us has, we have no control over at all. We have no control on the kind of parents we're born. I think yes. that's very true. There's a lot of that actually that comes into the book because a lot of these men who migrated to Australia in the late 1930s, June, of course, you know, like the men who were on the Denera, the really notorious ship uh, which transported a couple of thousand men out here and they were hideously abused on board the ship. Um, and they were refugees escaping, some of them, or many of them, from appalling brutality in their countries, Germany, Poland, um, and yet they had received this terrible treatment by, I think they were the British soldiers. Were they British soldiers? They were British soldiers on the Denera, mm -hmm. um, and not knowing what they were coming to. And I think a lot of uh, the, the, these stories come through in the book, but they're beautifully mixed with the political realities of Australia in the 19, late 30s and, and early 40s, as well as the social and cultural history of Australia at the time. So there were quite a lot of things that really are teased out in the book, but beautifully told through the stories of some of these men. And I wanted to talk a bit about, because it seemed to me, June, one of the things that came out very clearly was the fact that maybe some things haven't changed as much as we have liked them to. And I just want to read, if I may, this short letter. So these are... Oh, yeah refugee migrants coming, a lot of them from terrible trauma, hopefully to a new and better life, and many of them then enlist in the Australian Army, which seemed to me a remarkable thing to do anyway. But June, talk us a little bit about, they don't get to go into the military part of the Army, no. but they're in uniform, mm. 
So can you explain? Well, there is really military, what the book's but about. not in the fighting forces. Yeah. Although a few of them, and I think I have a couple mm. in the book, are desperate to get into the fighting forces. Uh, they feel humiliated that they, and some of them, some of them achieve it. And the interesting thing is. The army was slower mm. to accept the foreigners than either the Navy or the Air Force, mm. although the Air Force required certain skills that was very specialised. Um, but June, I think we're just going to swap out the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I not no, no, being no, no, no. No, it's the heard mic. properly? No, it's the mic is dropping out. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Beth, it was way back there or something, was it? So you can't hear me. I understand. I can hear myself. Okay, right. Is, is that can you can you all hear me? That's really do, good. Do, yeah. Look, do please let us know. No, you're fine, June. Keep going. Right, um, I've forgotten where I was there <laughs> actually. But yes, We're the army the was more that, reluctant, yeah. and there are some lovely stories. Uh, I remember it's one of the stories in the book um, because it's a li it's unusual. This one, uh, this is a a letter between two of the lab uh, two of the politicians of the day. Uh, one of whom writes, I can't remember the names of the politicians, but they're all in the cabinet, Labor cabinet, and one uh, contacts the bloke who who's supposed to be looking after the army, I think, and said that a neighbour of his, whose name is, and I don't remember his name, but it's in the book, um, uh, really keen to join the army, but he's been told he can't because he's... I forget where he came from, Germany or somewhere. And the, the uh, politician who's responsible for the army responds and says, make sure he goes to such and such a place or whatever. Don't worry, all will be well. And I, I just came across this correspondence in the research that I was doing. And then after a little while, there's another e a letter I was about to say emails, but there were no emails, <laughs> long before emails. There was another letter from the, the, the one who was inquiring about his neighbour, who was, if my memory is right, of Italian mm. background. And he, he praises him enormously. He's a marvellous man, a man of honour and so on. And so the, the bloke, the, the army bloke, says, well, you know, send him along. The trouble is he can't get into the army. He, he's, there's something wrong with his health. And he's not back. So, you know, it's not because he's of Italian origin. It's not be because... But they would take flat feet and all sorts of things. I don't know what this bloke had wrong with him. <laughs> but that was pretty unusual, June, because most of these poor refugees were de deemed to either be any enemy aliens. They were known as aliens, weren't they? And we yeah. had enemy aliens and refugee aliens and just aliens. Yes. So uh, aliens couldn't be in the fighting forces. They weren't allowed to carry a weapon. Oh, no, this is not quite true. They do. They, some of them end up in the air, uh, in other parts oh, of, yes, the, in the of, the, of the military. The and a few of the guys, and I think I have a, uh, refer to a few in the book, are determined that they want to get out of the employment companies. That's what it's called. So tell us about the employment companies, The employment June, companies. This is really the important. The army sets yeah. up a whole number of employment companies. It starts off being called labour companies and then very quickly gets called employment companies. I was unable, despite my re fairly extensive research, ever to discover why the name was changed. I suspect that initially the, the company is established uh, when Menzies is Prime Minister, not Labour, Liberal. Perhaps that was one reason, I don't know. But anyway, the name does get changed and the employment companies are soldiers in every respect, uniform pay, saluting, officers, the whole catastrophe, but they are never armed and they are never sent overseas. Mm. So, what do they do? Well, one of the very big tasks 
that a number of these companies spent much of their time doing was loading and unloading trains. You've got to think about Australia between 1939 and 1945. Going out onto the waters is very unwise because once the Japanese enter the war, their U-boats are around the Australian coast. And in fact, what we get, where there's a whole one chapter in the book is about the Chinese company. There's a whole mm. company of Chinese in the Australian Army, in the employment companies, and they're all overseas Chinese. They're not the local Chinese. There are mostly seamen whose ships come to land in Australia for safety. And there's another whole chapter over what we would now call Indonesians, although, of course, the Dutch, it was a Dutch colony. Mm. The Dutch had come to Australia. The colonial Dutch was like a government in exile in Australia during the war. It's a whole fascinating story. It is beautifully told in the book too. It's a wonderful chapter. Oh, thank you. And, and the, can you tell us, because about the Black Armada, and there's a wonderful quote where towards the end of the chapter, because these Indonesians, some of them had come out wanting independence from the Dutch, and that was one of the things that really leapt out at me that I hadn't really understood, that of course Indonesia was still a Dutch colony during the Second it World was. War. It was. And there's a wonderful quote, if I may say, if before you tell us about the Black Armada and Indonesian Go independence. On. For the first time in Australia's history, its government supported the legitimacy of an indigenous population, population in Asia to create its own government against the claims of a European power. That's right. And that was just, I thought that was revelatory. Because the Dutch had intended, okay, there's a war, it's crook, we'll go, there was a, a Dutch government, the colonial government in exile based in Brisbane was here, the Australian government put them up. They expected to go back mm. and run Into the countries that had been their colonies. But the countries that had been their colonies had another idea. And because we had, what the Dutch had done is they'd brought with them, the colonial Dutch, I mean, they had brought with them their servants and they had brought with them their prisoners. Now, these were often very intelligent, politically acute men among the prisoners who were patriots, but not of the Dutch. <laughs> and they very quickly in Australia, because they're in the army and they're other, they, they begin to recognise they're people you can talk to, you can talk to the trade unions. And in the end, the Australian trade unions would not load the Dutch ships to go back and there would, well I think it's too late now because time has passed, but there was once a generation of Indonesians who had a very soft spot for Australia because Australia prevented the Dutch from going back mm. and restoring the colony. Absolutely wouldn't fascinating. The, 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 they wouldn't load their ships. The Black Armada. Wonderful. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Marvellous stories. I mean, one of the great joys, I, you know, I don't, I'm not um, a writer who enjoys, I mean, that's the wrong word, I, it's the opposite. I want to like what I'm doing. I, I have to have my heart in it. Mm -hmm. And I did in this book. It was fascinating. I mean, I learned a great deal, of course, as I was going along. Um, and that's what I was writing about. I was sharing it with whoever was going to read the book. Well, much of it's about um, migration, migrants. It's very uh, prescient for now because we're in Refugee ah, Week, of course. Yes. And so we're talking about refugees. This but is Refugee Week by yeah, accident, isn't it, that's I right. think? Yes. Yeah. But one of the things early on in the book where we're talking about a lot of these migrants have arrived and of course they're, they're, it's a new country, but some of them are not being very well treated and the government has to figure out you know, as you do on the run when something changes, so the World War, War, World War II has broken out and now you've got this influx of people coming in. Well, most of them were interned, so we had detention camps 
right back in 19, from 1939 or earlier. Um, but there's a letter written in 1940 to Prime Minister Robert Menzies, as he was at the time, from a woman in Western Australia. And I just found this. Uh, I'll let you decide what you think about you it. You go but ahead. She writes, I have heard on the wire, and I really, it's really setting up some Australian attitudes, not all, thankfully. I have heard on the, on the wireless the news that Australia would be willing to receive internees from England. And these are actually refugees from Europe coming into England who were then going to be transported, as the Denera boys were. So they were basically, it was a new convict ship when they sent the Denera um, ship out with all of these poor um, refugees on it. I beg to protest. We have enough of the scum here already. Too many, in fact. I am not a vindictive woman. These aliens are God's creatures, just the same as we are. All the same, I sincerely trust that a U-boat gets every one of them. That was a letter I found in the archives addressed to Menzies, yes, um, that she sent. So there was that attitude and I spent time, you know, newspapers were, in those days, newspapers were the major way which news got around, um, probably more e than radio. The radio was another, but newspapers, I think, were, were more um, uh, in this area. And um, you would get a letter to the editor, you get more than one letter to the editor, along the lines of, I am the wife of a man who is now fighting in New Guinea or something, and I am horrified to see these foreigners, you know, able to run their shops or whatever it is. Every foreigner, in the eyes of some of them, every foreigner was somehow taking over the country or, you know, taking the place of their men who are now fighting. Well, of course, the truth is that a lot of these foreigners were now in doing, wearing exactly the same uniform as their husbands or brothers were saluting the flag and being marched up and down. There's, I think there's a lovely story I tell in one, one case where um, the sergeant trying to get the men in his company to march and he said, well, sing. If you sing, you know, you'll get a rhythm. What should we sing? Sing whatever you like. So as it happened in this, in this particular com uh, company, there were a lot of the men had come from Germany. So they sang German marching songs. I can't remember if it was Sydney or Melbourne, all up and down the street as they were marching. Um, there's wonderful sort of little episodes where you realise it's as if there's a very thin membrane mm. that separates people and they keep breaking it. Mm. Um, there was a hierarchy of aliens as they were known. There were allied aliens and neutral aliens and refugee aliens. Can you talk to us a little bit about aliens? Yes. Well, it, that allied aliens were people who came from the countries of our allies. So, for example, my father uh, was an allied... I think he would have been, a, yes, an allied alien because he came from Poland. And, and Poland was overrun by the Nazis, but it wasn't actually allied with them. I mean, it was, in fact, it was one of the early invasions. Uh, in fact, the war is declared basically in the invasion of you know, Poland, even though they had already, the, the Nazis had already invaded Czechoslovakia before that. Um, and so there were allied agents. Well, that, that meant countries that were formerly allies of Australia. And then what were the others? There was then you've got neutral aliens. Yes. There were some countries the that were Swiss neutral. The Swiss or the Swedish? I'm, uh, I'm the, trying to remember. The what, Swiss and the Swedish. The Swiss and so on. Now, theoretically, the rule set in Australia, you cannot... Um, neutral uh, aliens are not... They cannot be conscripted and they should not be. And yet there were some Swiss and Swedes in, in the... They obviously put their hand up and said, I'm going. Mm. They, you know, it was one thing for, what, for the government to lay down a rule and it was another thing to what actually happened, happened. on the ground. 
I don't think there were very med, many Swiss and Swedes in the Australian Army, but there were some. So these employment companies, as they were known, these were the 32 military units, I guess you could call them, that, um, which, which is where any migrant or alien who enlisted in the army, this is where they went. They went into one of these 32 companies, employment companies. There were 11 of them. 11, there were 11... 32 uh, numbers? 11 um, alien companies. 11 alien companies out of the 32 employment companies. Is that right? That's right. So 32 employment companies, 11 of which were specifically aliens. That's so they right. didn't mix. So if you're Australian born... Not and until right bef towards the end of the war mm. when some of the um, alien companies were sort of amalgamated mm. with a non-alien... Company. company, and this is before the men would, you know, very soon they're going to be released anyway. The war's over and everybody, you know, gets out. But uh, basically there were 11 alien companies. The, if I put my glasses on, I can read this. The second and third were based in New South Wales. The fourth, the sixth and the eighth were based in Victoria. The tenth was based in South Australia. The seventh, the 11th, the 12th and the 23rd were based in Western Australia and the 36th were based in Queensland. And the seventh company was all Chinese and they weren't local Chinese. Mm. They were the overseas the Chinese. The 23rd was what they called Kopangese, which we would now call Dutch, places like Dutch Timor, or Indonesia. And, uh, well, no, Dutch Timor, and the 36 was called Javanese, a word we don't hear much of now, Indonesian. Mm. And they were all in the Australian Army. Mm. Well, it's, so they were, they were employment companies for supplying military labour for works projects and labour tasks, but not as cooks or batmen. No. Even though some of them were sometimes put to work peeling potatoes. There's a story in one of the oh, chapters yeah. about that. But they seem to have been really, um, some of them remarkably um, creative units. So, and they all got on incredibly well. So you'd have quite a mixture of um, nationalities in these employment companies, not obviously in the purely Chinese or, right. or um, Kopangese or the, um, but all the others. Javanese, but all the others were mixed. And they all got on incredibly well. And they were also, they had, some of them had uh, put on theatre shows, um, musical, uh, discussions about literature, ideas, socialism. Um, and then the, there's... I'll talk about that in a minute. But So talk to us a little bit about that because... Oh, yes. The cult, well, um, they were very talented. There were some very talented people in, in, in the mix, of course, as always, in, in all the military. There, and so you had writers and all theatre, people that had experience in the theatre, musicians. Mm. Um, I have, one of my cousins was in the same company as my father, uh, but of course Andy was just 18, and he was a violinist. Mm. And in the company, in the sixth employment company, they had a trio, a violin, Oh, I can't remember. But I, what I remember, I can't remember the other two instruments, but one of them turned out to be uh, one of the men who worked on the railway lines. He wasn't, um, he wasn't even in the army. He was a railway man, but he played... Because Andy played the violin. They had a violin and a cello, cello. and I forget the third instrument. It might have been a flute, mm -hmm. and it might have been the railway man was the fl flautist. And they used to give concerts and they raised money. Yes, you know, they raised a the, lot of the, money. All of that sort of thing. Yeah. Some companies had this wonderful theatre group and they'd come down to Melbourne and put on a performance in Melbourne for a Melbourne audience. It would raise money for a, a, a military uh, purpose, for a charity or whatever. Yes, the, as well as marching up and down and doing all those sorts of things, but they were never armed and I think I do tell the story of a of a, a, a truck coming in one day loaded with rifles and the company's tremendously excited at last oh. here are the guns they're going to teach us there was a mistake <laughs> and the truck is turned around and goes off to wherever it was meant to go 
But they were allowed to, to load bombs. Oh, yes, that's the irony. They're not allowed themselves to be taught to fight, but they load and unload trains, including... And, in fact, I interviewed a bloke who still, in his old age, had a, a, a war injury from a bomb that hit him in unloading a train during the war. And he was still liable for regular checkups to this back injury that he had got during the war from a, an unfortunate encounter. With a bomb. With a bomb. <laughs> that was one of the things that I hadn't ever really understood was actually the importance of the work that these oh, men yeah. did. Um, so there's a thing about the, you know, what was the relevance and importance of this hard physical labour done by some of the employment companies well, for I mean, the war effort? They are, they are loading and unloading both weaponry and goods. Some of them drive trucks. I mean, rem remember, as I think I said earlier, you can't use the water. Sorry, you can't use the sea. So you've got roads and rail. And Tell us about in the New those South Wales, days, Victoria. Yes. Mm. Remember, <laughs> Australia was settled by British and Irish, but they come out from different places and they don't all talk to each other very fondly. And one of the results of that is that when the war breaks out, you can't go from Victoria to New South Wales or from New South Wales to Queensland or the other way round on a train. You can go up to the border on a train and you can get on a, another railway line train. Do you see what I'm getting? I, I found a wonderful quote from um, one of the great... Mark Twain oh, yes, came yes, to Australia yes. in the 1850s or 1860s and I happened upon a wonderful sardonic paragraph in his account of his time in Australia, from that period of being woken up at dawn to get off a train, to get on another train going. I can't remember can whether he was going from New South Wales to Victoria or the other way round. June, would you like to read it? Because it's absolutely a superb Oh, quotation. where? Show me where it right is. Right there. On that left hand page. Oh, right. This is from 1895, Mark Twain commenting wryly after his visit to Australia. The oddest thing, the strangest thing, the unaccountable marvel that Australia can show at the frontiers between New South Wales and Victoria, our multitude of passengers were routed out of their snug beds by lantern light in the morning, in the biting cold, to change cars. Think of the paralysis of intellect that gave that idea birth. <laughs> Imagine the boulder it emerged from on some <laughs> petrified legislator's shoulders. <laughs> he was not impressed. He was definitely not impressed. You do have to wonder about the idea of different <laughs> gauges for your railway lines. Yes. Seriously. So Sorry. something <laughs> that had been created in, 18, in the 1850s was still around mm. in the 1940s. Mm. And I think I did look up and it didn't get changed for decades, till decades later. Yes. You still had to get off at the border between there, Victoria and New South Wales. There are some wonderful stories in the book and some really wonderful quotations and I have to give you this one, June, because I just loved it. So the employment companies are doing a lot of work. They're, they're moving timber. They're, as June has said, you know, trains, trucks, loading, unloading, doing all sorts of really, really important, but mostly, I think, invisible war work, that most of which has just been pa has passed unnoticed, as June has said, a sort of footnote in the history of Australia's war. But um, so in doing this work, one of the gentlemen said, if it was pick and shovel work, you grabbed a shovel if possible, because you can't lean on a, on a pick. <laughs> <laughs> I think he'd learned something from the Australian work, workers' tradition that, you know, you, the boss is not just going to be the, you know, you've got 
mm. some rights as well. Well, he wasn't the only one because there's that marvellous story about, um, you know, there were, uh, a couple of the companies had really good commanders, really mm. good leaders, yeah. very um, compassionate, intelligent, you know, that really kind of engendered great, um, I think, fraternity in these companies. And one of them was they were given time off to go to church so one of the guys was asked, you know, what really, oh, I'm Jewish. Well, he doesn't need to go to church on Sunday. So he got to stay back at camp and do all this cleaning. So the next week when they said, well, oh, I'm a Catholic. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, so, yes. And there is a real element of that kind of, you know, it was really refreshing to discover oh, that that yes. Australianism of sort of everyone gets a fair go, that it's actually a real thing, you know. It was, it was very apparent in yeah. many of the stories that you tell yeah. that I think the migrants, the refugees, the aliens, that they actually found this to be something very refreshing. Some of them did. Some. Uh, we should not romanticise no, no, it entirely. No, no, I'm not trying to no, quite right. Um, but, yes, I mean, that was the eighth employment company had this wonderful... Um, Bloke in charge. It was actually a, New Z a Maori, part Maori, New Zealander. Mm. And he was like a father to these men. And there's some really quite funny stories, I think I'd tell a couple, because he was very concerned about their wealth, their well being. And so, and some of them, were, some of the men were Jewish. And so he insisted on sort of accompanying them down to make sure they got to the synagogue. <laughs> which didn't actually suit all of them because they weren't all religious. <laughs> not, that was not in their intention to go to the synagogue. That wasn't where they, they had planned to go. But he didn't realise that. He thought, oh, well, if this, you know, Christians go to church and Jews go to a synagogue, of course we'll get you to the synagogue. I never actually got to hear where the men finally got to, but... <laughs> No, he, he, was a, he was a very... Not all the officers were like him. No. There were some officers that they were not madly fond of. It depended on the company and it, it depended on the, on the circumstances. Some, some of them get wonderful nicknames. You'll have to find those yeah. in the book. But um, also, so yeah. far from perhaps romanticising, this certainly was a very racist element in different stories and, and in different men's experiences. Um, and, of course, we had the white Australia policy oh, yes. that is really pervasive throughout these, these stories and throughout this, this, this really terrific history. Um, and I think, you know, you, you write... I mean, you write so beautifully, June. There are some really wonderful phraseologies and, and it's just so readable. But you... This lovely quote... That determined... The white Australia policy that determined bulwark against the, quote, deadly coloured alien biped. No, that's what the thing was, mm. yes. But there's a whole company of Chinese. Mm. And there's a whole company of what we now call Indonesians. I mean, this is the fascinating thing. Necessity is the mother of many mm. things, including the military. I mean, they were not going to waste... The, the, the manpower. The, the manpower. Mm. And very sensibly, they didn't. But um, that's interesting too about the Chinese company because what happened at the end of the war? There are, ships, was a wait, revelation. There are ships waiting to take them back to Hong Kong. There is a ship waiting to take them. But that is, you see the beginnings of what later develops a certain resistance. There was, I think it's in the book, I can't remember now. It's a while since I've read it. Um, there's a, a, a one Chinese bloke who's married, and I think there's even a child from the marriage. And you'll get the first glimpses of what, in my generation, becomes much bigger. Australians speaking up, mm. non-Chinese Australians speaking up uh, in defence of the Chinese, because you've got to remember that the Chinese in the army are not the local Chinese. Mm. But they've worked for the Austra for Australia, and then they work for the. Uh, for, then they the end Americans. up working for the Americans yeah. for the so American army. So they do army. all this work for us, and then at yeah. the end of the war, they're but just there's supported. a ship waiting to take them back. It's and I, I get to my, I, it was a sort of I was really glad to to find this out that there were even then, not many. I mean, a few people from Melbourne University. Mm went down to the wharf, uh, there was the beginnings of what later was to become a much bigger resistance. 
to the notion that Asians could not live in Australia, mm. you know, that they were not Australians, could not well, become Australians, um, were not proper Australians. And I saw the very first handful, probably fewer than the fingers of one hand, but they were down at the wharf. You write um, really interestingly too about the Council for Civil Liberties ah, that yes. was developed. I think that was... Ah, yes. There are... There's a whole chapter in the book about those who speak up mm. for the thing. And there's all sorts of people. The head of the Catholic Church um, speaks up. Mm. Um, there are, and there is already... Um, Brian Fitzpatrick was the founder. And it's a name we should remember and honour. Brian Fitzpatrick was the founder of the uh, Victorian Council, or then I think it might have even been called the Australian Council, I can't remember, of Civil Liberties... And he's a marvellous, um, a marvellous propagandist. Mm. So uh, he's a very educated, cultivated man. He's on radio giving talks. You know, he's writing articles for the newspapers. He's everywhere. And this is very influential, mm. you know, because people are listening to these programs. You know, th people want to know about the war. It's their brothers, their uncles, their fathers. And so there is, during the war, I think, an opportunity that some of these remarkable people take of enlarging the scope of what it means to be an Australian. Mm, absolutely. And that was a really remarkable thing to do. The other really remarkable thing that struck me towards the end of the book is salt. Oh, yes. I, just, I was quite stunned that the Australian the army, the military, had created this magazine newspaper mm. called SALT, yes. all about educating but and... It, oh. Yeah, and the education um, set up. That they, oh, can you talk yes. to us about Absolutely. those things? The, well, the, more generally, I mean, uh, not talking now about the aliens, there were men in the army who were illiterate, who had never really learnt to read and write. That's a danger. Mm. And so, generally speaking, the army had a, an arm of education. And among other things, it taught people to read and write while they were in uniform. When it came to the alien companies, that wasn't on the whole an issue. Um, but they, they were, there was this marvellous publication called SALT, from Pass the Salt, published by the army. You, if you're lucky, sometimes if you go into a second-hand bookshop, you might find a, a, a copy of one of the issues. I spent a lot of time going into second-hand bookshops and accumulating a number of copies of, the, of Salt. You can still sometimes find them. They were terrific. They were little publications, like a little magazine. They were illustrated. They had useful hints for soldiers about... They educated them about Papua New Guinea, if they were going to go there or something. They told them about good things for their health. Um, they had cartoons and jokes. They were a proper little magazine and they circulated not just through the employment companies but through the, the army generally. And I think it's been forgotten that the people who were in the army's employ... Uh, who were doing these things ought to have got medals. Mm. I mean, it was it kept the spirits going, it kept them connected to each other, and it helped to educate them. And it was um, the Army Education Service, about which I don't even know if there is one anymore. Mm. I've not heard of it. But it was a very important arm of the military during the Second World War. Yes, with enormous numbers of people. But there might people. be people who would like to ask questions. Well, that's where we're getting to. Absolutely, we're getting that to was that. the next thing. I just wanted to read this last thing. There are two uh, quotations from your book. One is from the wonderful Brian Fitzpatrick, who, as you said... The civil libertarian. ...ought to yeah. be. And he said, Refugees, Hitler's loss, our gain. Yes. Which I think is a fantastic quotation. And then Robert Menzies, who, in the early part of the book, you actually point out had a few good things to say about Hitler... Mm. Uh, which I he went and vis visited yeah. Germany mm -hmm. and came back and said Hitler was, was a great organiser. And he had some really good ideas. Yeah. But later, 
he does give us this wonderful quotation. The greatest tragedy that could overcome a country would be for it to fight a successful war in defence of liberty and lose its own liberty in the process. Mm. And I think yeah. that's a really great point to end on, perhaps. Yeah. There's so much more I could talk about, no, June. But I wondered if people might this, have... This, that's what I thought. We'll go to questions. Yeah, but questions this, or comments. This book yeah. is rich in, as I said, you know, story, but also in social history, cultural history, and many, many things that I certainly had never thought Thank about you. or, <laughs> you know, been aware of. And um, I really do highly recommend it. And so, so readable. So congratulations, June. Thank you. So we'll take some questions, if anyone, we have a question over here. and Could you speak up? We, we just have a microphone coming. Oh, there's a microphone, the yep. excellent. Just so you can. Thank you. The um, Dutch colonies that came to Australia with Could you just speak a little bit louder? Yeah, the Dutch colonies that came to Australia and were not allowed to go back to Indonesia afterwards, what happened to these people? Did they stay in Australia? Did they go back to Europe? Or? Mostly they went back. Mostly they, oh yes, the white Australia policy was very white. But what about, he's talking about the Dutch. So the Dutch from Indonesia. Oh, but the Dutch, the Dutch can't colonists. go, it's finita yes. la musica. The end of the colonies, the Second World War. And the, one of the marvellous parts of this story is that there was a reluctance of the waterside workers in Australia to load the Dutch boats. And did the Dutch colonists go back to Holland? No, I don't think so. Or did they so. stay in Australia? I didn't follow them, but they certainly didn't get their country. They didn't get it back. So they mostly they stayed basically, here? Um, the, the local, the, the um, Indonesians take, more or less take their country back. I can't remember the detail now, I'm sorry. And I, so I can't, um, I can't be more explicit, did but basically, um, the, the Dutch colonial government never reigns again in Indonesia. Did they try to fight it, the Dutch? I think the Dutch wanted to go back. As I say, the Australian uh, mm. war fees wouldn't load their boats. <laughs> that helped. Interesting what you can make that happen helped. with a bit of refusal. Other questions? Were the men conscripted into the companies or did they volunteer? Largely conscripted. Okay. It's largely conscription. Um, I don't know the proportion because that information, um, I would have had to look uh, or I would have had to find their, their original sort of enrolment things. And I think while there were volunteers, and some get sent home, you know, they go to a, a thing and they say where they come from and, the, and the, they say, sorry, mate, you know. Go away. You know. <laughs> Did your father enlist or was he conscripted? Do you know? I don't know. Oh, interesting. I don't know. Some people, some men certainly did volunteer. The questions you wish you could ask the dead. <laughs> and then there was a, yes. there was one fellow who actually enlisted, I think, in the RAAF. Yes. And then when they discovered that he was an alien, they kicked him out again. That's right. Yes, there was some part. But on the other hand, I think the navy took them earlier than mm. the army did. Mm. It's a, different bits of the army had different rules, and I found that really. I mean, I didn't. I wasn't going to write the Encyclopaedia Britannica. I'm writing a book about the aliens in the Australian Army. So I didn't follow up some of these things. But I did notice that in some other parts of the military, there weren't the same restrictions. Um, you could go and be a seaman. And I think you... I don't know how you got into the Air Force, but you could perhaps be in the Air Force as well. But the Army wouldn't take you. It's very odd. But I didn't, fo I didn't try following all those leads, so I'm afraid you're not going to find that solution in the book. You're going to have to do your own research on that one. <laughs> but you will find lots of other things. Uh, do we have any other questions? More questions? Any yes. Oh, somebody's going to bring you over a mic. Sorry, just to raise the mic. And were they paid the same as um, soldiers? I'm seats? not hearing you very well, sorry. sorry. Just put it close to your mouth. Were they paid the same as the soldiers overseas? Were they paid the same as oh, the, yes. as the Australian soldiers? Oh, yes, absolutely the same. Mm. Yes, 
I forget what it was, the same number of shillings. Six shillings a day. I mean, they're the same uniform. Um, there's a very interesting, I think I talk about this a bit in the book. There's an interesting debate in upper military circles about the patch. There's some who don't want them to have the same sort of patch, but they do. Mm. Uh, um, they are the whole, you know, from their boots to their hats, they're in the Australian uniform. Um, they have their own patch, but it's exactly the sort of, it's the same sort of thing as every other, you know, it in identifies a company, but it's no different than any other kind of patch that identifies a company. That there was a debate, internal military debate, and I think also political debate mm. on that particular score. So one up for the refugees. They they are proper solid. They're paid exactly the same way. They're dressed exactly the same way. They get leave exactly the same way. They get out of the military in exactly the same way. For example, when they're finally at the end of the war, how do they get out? Well, they usually give preference to married men. And so married men usually got out a bit sooner. You couldn't just walk out. You, you couldn't be, just yeah. say, oh, good, the, arm, the war's over, bye. <laughs> um, you had to. And you get out <clears throat> with some money. You've earned money. Um, you know, in, you get paid. And they get paid the same as other soldiers. They also had the same right to go to the university. Oh, yeah. some of them are already getting... That some of them are part-time students mm. even while they're um, still working. working. Because of particularly, for example, if you're based in Melbourne a lot, there's the universities just down the road sort of thing. And some of them were very enterprising. There were musicians. Um, there were, there's a lot of talent, mm. uh, a lot of all sorts of talent in, among these men. And at the end of the war, you get two... As you would expect, I think, two very diverse responses. There are those who want nothing more to do with anything to do with the war. They don't want to keep the friendships. They don't want to avoid... You know, they want a new start. And there's the others who are the opposite, who do... You, some of them, for example, initially they couldn't join the RSL. Mm. It, I forget its long title. Um, first of all, the RSL had a rule, general rule, that they would only allow membership for those who served overseas. Now, that left out a hell of a lot of Australian soldiers. Ultimately, that got changed. And, but then the last change was to allow the foreigners in. Mm. By which time, many of the groups had already established their own post, you know, Return service. ex servicemen yeah. groups and said, you know, blow you lot, you know, we'll, we'll do our own. Yeah. Post-war stuff is interesting. We probably have time for one more question. More Anyone? questions? Anyone? No? I think you probably answered them all, June. No, no, I'm, I'm sure <laughs> that, that. Then they won't read the book. <laughs> no, well. No, I, I promise sure you I haven't. <laughs> so the last thing I'll say, because on this uh, subject of sort of what happened after the war and this idea of education, because returned servicemen were entitled oh, yes. to go to the university and were given a bit of a stipend. They were. Funding. They were helped with funding. Yeah, yes, which is they fantastic. Were. And the idea of um, the educational arm of the army, oh, which yeah. I thought was brilliant. You have a wonderful quotation. So this, the idea of the education army, uh, I I the educational arm of the army, of the military, was this idea of um, giving the soldier, and this is a quote, faith in the political, economic and social institutions for which he is fighting. And I think that's a really fascinating element of that era where, you know, you had this idea of a higher... And I, I, I don't know, but some of you might in the audience might know, I don't know if the army still does this. No, I don't know. But the army ha had a marvellous education wing. Does anybody know? They do, yes. 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 Does it? I'm sorry, I can't hear. Can you speak up? Need the oh, microphone. <laughs> no. My dad works for the Air Force and...
um, they have an active recruitment program for high school students who are leaving. And as part of this program, you get free university education for whichever career you'd like to study. And then you agree to do the same amount of years paid in the Yes. in the Air Force, Army or Navy when you finish. Right. I'm very glad to hear it. Fantastic. Yes, yes that's wonderful. good. Oh, no, I mean, in the more general Army, I mean, pe because people are conscripted, uh, it's not all, by, the Army is by no means, in either, mm. either with the refugees or, or with the old Australians, it's the same. Not everybody wants to volunteer, but they might get conscripted. Uh, and there are people who are illiterate. I mean, before the Second World War, Schooling, people left school 14. at nine, nine. Oh. aged nine. Wow. I mean, you know, they hadn't gone very far in their schooling, some of them. And there were, there were illiterates in the army and the army was concerned about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think one of the great things that comes out of the book is this extraordinary contribution. And I think that it's the sort of beginning for Australia to really evolve into a, this much more inclusive, tolerant, hopefully tolerant society yeah. of, and, and this melting pot of nationalities that we are today. And I think that you can certainly see some of the seeds of that in the experiences of the migrants and the refugees or aliens, whichever you yes. want to call them. Although I, I wouldn't, I don't want to romanticise No, no, it, I don't either. Uh, in that, you know, if after the war, you, it could, you could still be called a bloody Jew or a, a Dago or something like that. Um, there were still places where it wasn't wise probably to go at night in the evenings. You could get bashed up. Um, but it did perhaps begin the idea for certainly some Australians yeah. that people, that foreigners or aliens were just people it, and I think making I, a contribution. Oh, I think, I think so that's true. I think true. that certainly was true I think for that is true. But people. you still, and I have, them in, I have examples in the book of the letters to the editor, mm. to newspapers, uh, which are very unhappy about these men mm. being in the... In, and there were, there's a particular... Oh, God, I'm hopeless at names. There's a particular new, newspaper. What's it called? Well, it was there long before. It's, a, it's sort of a newspaper come magazine almost, and it's very anti-alien, always mm. was, mm. Mm. always was. The war doesn't change its attitude at all. So you're still getting, for those who regard people who can't speak English without an accent or something as not having a right to be here, um, there's, still plenty of pe there's still plenty of material around to support their views. But in terms of the military itself, no. No. Well, that's, at least that's encouraging. Ah, yes. And I do hope we've evolved enough. Well, June Facts are wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. A terrific book and a really wonderful read. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Thank you very much. And thank, and thank, thank you, you all for, for coming. Great us with your presence at the Geelong Library and at Wadi Wurrung, a wonderful oh. high ground. Uh, it's... it's, it's it's very nice to talk about the book because it was a labour of love, really. Um, most of the time, I was really glad I was doing it. Occasionally, when I got couldn't find something I wanted, uh, my ground my teeth. But but one of the best things I did was to interview people, mm. and you'll see a lot of names in the look at the acknowledgements, even though you don't know the people. Thank them. Yep. These are the people who gave me a great deal of the information. I did a lot of uh, library research and archival research as well, but there's something very special about hearing from somebody who was there. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening.